Welcome back to the Modern Challenges of Extraterrestrial Hypothesis Conference, Roswell, New Mexico's 70th anniversary. It's a pleasure to once again welcome up Dr. Michael Heiser. Uh, he's been, this is his fifth talk that he's prepared for this event. And it's been many years since he was here, 2009. He did a, one great talk at our Christian Symposium called Why an Extraterrestrial God Appeals Today to Today's Culture. And I think today's is reminding me of it, but from a flip side perspective, he's gonna bring a science fiction televangelism for ET religion and see how the, the mindset of this alien phenomena is really getting into people's heads and creating new belief systems. It's, that's a recurring theme in this uh, conference as well. I look forward to seeing uh, Dr. Heiser and Mike drive this one home. Welcome them up, please. Thank you. We're a bit tethered this time, so hopefully I won't uh, bring down anything with me. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, in the annual academic meetings every November, everyone who submits a paper hopes that they're not selected to deliver a paper on Tuesday morning after everyone has gone. <laughs> I, have, I have been in that slot once, and uh, you know, this is actually a better attendance than I had at the uh, annual meeting. <laughs> so I know how it is, but thanks for coming. I know it's, it's late in the week, and you know, everybody's thinking about going home, getting back to normal. Uh, this talk is sort of self-explanatory in, in one sense, science fiction televangelism for ET religion. What I want to do is I want to overview sort of how uh, science fiction writers and of course media like film and, and a little bit of television have been vehicles to articulate a theology. Okay? Uh, and specifically a theology of the extraterrestrial as sort of displacing or replacing traditional theism and in some cases traditional Judeo-Christian uh, worldview, Judeo-Christian theology. I have to confess that the real authority on uh, ET stuff in Hollywood is not me, it's, it's, it's Robbie Graham. And so I want to give him a shout out. Uh, you should all go get his Silver Screen Saucers book. It's an excellent work. Uh, lots of detail. This is going to be sort of an overview with a theological twist to it. And for the sake of, of uh, I think at least half the audience probably are going to be you know, someone who would be a traditional theist or, or a Christian, perhaps. So I want to, again, just provoke your thought a little bit in terms of what the, the kind of things that we like to watch. Slide. It's not working. Yeah, let's give it a click there. Okay. Let's talk first about elements of what I will loosely refer to here as the extraterrestrial gospel. We have generally sort of new myths in place of old creeds. Okay. New myths in place of old creeds. And I want to start off with a few uh, quotations from, I think, you know, some, in some cases will be well-known sources and others, other sources I think that are pretty important here. There is today at a time when old beliefs are withering, a kind of philosophical hunger, a need to know who we are and how we got here. There's an ongoing search, often unconscious, for a cosmic perspective for humanity. As I noted at the bottom, that was Carl Sagan way back in 1973. But, you know, honestly, it could have been yesterday. Uh, this is just sort of the way things are. Uh, again, this philosophical hunger, I would say a spiritual hunger. Uh, you know, most people don't think consciously about theologies, but, but I, I can say a theological hunger as well. And for those of you who are Christians, you know that the New Testament, specifically Paul in Romans 1, uh, again, my paraphrase of his language, it talks about how every every human part sort of has a God-shaped void in it and wants to fill it with something something transcendent, who are we, how did we get here, who made us, that sort of thing. And this is what, what Satan is really sort of striking at here. Ray Kurzweil, and the singularity is near, says we need a new religion. 
Now, again, he's specifically talking about transhumanism, but transhumanism is going to be a theme in science fiction, and in some cases, it will be linked to extraterrestrial realities as they're cast in science fiction. The search for superior beings, the quest for extraterrestrial intelligence is itself a kind of religion. Yeah, I, I would wholeheartedly agree. This is Stephen Dick, who is a, a historian of the extraterrestrial life conversation in his book, Life on Other Worlds, the 20th Century Extraterrestrial Life Debate, which is a 1998 title. Uh, Dick has authored a number of books on the history of the extraterrestrial you know, possibility, both in terms of broader Western civilization, and also specifically uh, within the church, and broadly speaking, church historical discussion. And he's right, the search for superior beings, think about it, which of course is related intimately to, and you can almost make it a synonym, the quest for extraterrestrial intelligence is in itself a kind of religion. This will be an extended quote. There is an emerging canon. And again, for those of us who are Christians, C-A-N-O-N is a significant word. Canon refers to the body of sacred literature, that which is considered inspired. There is an emerging canon of transcendent stories that provides meaning to our lives. The myth-making work of two powerful engines of cultural influence. Speculative science, and yes, science can be speculative. Okay, even though scientists don't like to talk in those terms, it certainly is in many respects. Speculative science and the works of science fiction presented to us as a much needed alternative to more traditional perspectives on God, people, and the destiny of the human race. An alternative that will open a spiritual pathway into the increasingly technological future. Another way of saying that is this, as he puts it, the emerging canon, again, in these engines of cultural influence, are preparing us for our destiny, at least as we perceive it, or as many perceive it, in a technological society context. This is from James Herrick's book, Scientific Mythologies, How Science and Science Fiction form new, form new, Forge New Religious Beliefs. This is an excellent book. Uh, this is InterVarsity Press. I think I have a picture of it here, yeah. Uh, Jim Herrick um, is a professor of, well, what's his field? It's not, he's not a scientist or, um, or a religion scholar, but he's a, he's a professor of rhetoric in, uh, in <coughs> he's, in, he's in the reform tradition for those Christians in the audience. Um, he's a good guy. I mean, I, I've, I've met him, talked to him a number of times. This is an excellent book. Uh, he's written other books uh, as well that I would certainly recommend but for our subject matter today. Uh, this is an excellent volume. So specific elements, moving from generalities to some, sp some specific uh, theological tenets or theological ideas. E.T. theism, and just think about that term, E.T. theism. Uh, it's not really an oxymoron <laughs> for any. New gods for a technological post-Christian age. Once life has started in a relatively benign environment and billions of years of evolutionary time are available, the expectation of many of us is that intelligent beings would develop. Again, Carl saying in different source this time, dragons of Eden, speculations on the evolution of human intelligence. By the end of the 19th century, the myth of the intelligent, spiritual, and benevolent E.T. was entrenched in Western thought. I want to, I want to comment on that. I've cut out uh, a number of, of points about sort of the history of the Are There Other Worlds debate that can be traced, again, all the way back to the Church Fathers. This statement, uh, again, has a lot behind it. In the, in the Middle Ages, and we'll just say gen we'll use generalities here, in the Middle Ages, the church was very positively predisposed to the idea of there being other worlds. As I mentioned yesterday, I don't know which talk it was, but there was a time when it was considered theologically aberrant to deny God's ability and the possibility that other worlds can exist because you can't say that God couldn't do something. Because that's just not theologically permissible within the bounds of 
omnipotence. Of course, God could do something. So, if you deny that there were other worlds, you were sort of perceived as denying some point of, of omnipotence, so something that God could do. Well, that was the church. And broadly speaking, as you go through the early modern period up into the modern period, you have a number of writers speculating, and typically in, in terms of fiction, we didn't really have the term science fiction at this point. But in, in terms of fiction, they were proposing and writing about other worlds. The most familiar audience, I think, uh, the most familiar instance of this for Christians would not be something in the 19th century, it would be something in the 20th century, like C.S. Lewis's uh, trilogy, The Out of the Silent Planet, Carolina, and the Hideous Strike. Well, there were writers before Lewis writing what we would later call science fiction and selling a good number of books. This was a popular, and by the end of the 19th century, a familiar idea. And it included, uh, I think it's fair to say, probably you know, in the 18th century sometime, you would have had the first book that talked about alien visitation to this world. So in other words, the question wasn't are there other worlds, but uh, Fontenelle uh, has a, had a book specifically about this idea that that there were visitors from other worlds that came here rather than later science fiction, we go visit, we go visit other worlds, and you can see us this is uh, the silent planet. So both ideas were again in in the intellectual culture, in, in, the, in the literate in the culture, those people who read books by the end of the 19th century. By the end of the 20th, ET visitation and the dis displacement of theism, either current theism, you know, how people thought about God in the 20th century, or the idea that the gods in antiquity were actually extraterrestrials, those ideas were also entrenched in Western thought. Uh, and again, this is kind of obvious for those of you who are here at this conference. All I need to do is mention Zachary Sitchin, the Earth Chronicles, and Eric Von Daniken. Uh, again, that's not going away. It's firmly entrenched in the way that we think today. Now, you also have, again, to bolster, or I shouldn't say bolster, but to reinforce maybe or, or kind of operate in the background to, to help convince people you know, of, of the idea. You have official sources. Again, a lot of this stuff was talked about this week from the military, NASA, wondering about UFOs. Well, when people see you know, really smart people in the government, if you have like a government label or a military job or you're part of the intelligence community, you're perceived as being in the know. And so when you're wondering about extraterrestrial life, or you're speculating that, oh yeah, it's out there or it's already been here, that reinforces what you're reading in science fiction. It just does that for people. It lends validity to an idea that you might have been here reading fiction or books like Von Daniken that sort of purport to be nonfiction. But you know, kind of get poo pooed and ridiculed. Well, look, well, with official people, you know, start talking about the same thing. It, it, it makes it just sound more reasonable. Unofficial sources, of course, more science fiction writers, filmmakers. A uh, film is, I think, is arguably even more influential today than uh, science science fiction books. Or they often they made into movies anyway. But again, where we're at, this idea, you know, both of these ideas that. Well, maybe the gods of the antiquity, or God as we think of them today, is that really the being that religious books tell us it is, like the Bible? Maybe God is an extraterrestrial, or the gods of other cultures, that, you know, those are extraterrestrials. In other words, we don't have, it, it, it's foolish or, or, or not, the conversation isn't owned by people who talk about a spiritual world. God, angels, demons, that sort of thing. The, the conversation is now at least equally represented by those who would say, well, we don't really need to even think about a spiritual world, something distinct from the material world. We're talking about extraterrestrials, which are we're part of the material world. They're, they're beings that are involved just like we are. And that sort of mental transition is kind of important. Here are a few of Dick's books. I just wanted to expose you to the titles here. Plurality of Worlds, Extraterrestrial Life Debate. Uh, there's a, a volume that precedes this one. This one is 1750 to 1900 by Michael Crow. Again, this is well-traveled turf in, in academia. This one is a little more recent. 
Bennett, Jeffrey Bennett, Beyond UFOs, The Search for Extraterrestrial Life, and the Astonishing Implications for Our Future. This is focused a lot on religious aspects, religious implications. This is another work by Stephen Dick, Many Worlds. Alien Worlds, ET Culture, Contact with Ancient with Alien Civilizations. All of these books and the ones that preceded are published by academic presses. And that's why I wanted to list them here. This is not, these are not self-published. It's not, you know, sort of a, you know, kind of a popular press or something like, you know, inner traditions books or that publishes you know, executive decisions material. These are all university press level publishers. And this is just a small sample. Uh, I, I have, I don't want to say it all because, you know, I, I probably have missed something. But I have most of the academic literature published on this subject, and there's a lot of it. And that doesn't even count journal literature, the religious you know, angle, the religious implications of extraterrestrial life. Arthur C. Clarke, again, famously said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And Michael Sherman, again, famous atheist, sort of stole that and said any sufficiently advanced ETI, extraterrestrial intelligence, is indistinguishable from God. And if you really think about that, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of truth in that. Because if we if we encountered an extraterrestrial, if, we, if there was some disclosure and it had astonishing technology, it's a really short leap for people to think, well, all those all those sort of miracles that you read about in the Bible or religious books, maybe they weren't miracles. Maybe they were technology. Again, if you were, were confronted with this reality, and in many ways, we already had it in our heads very firmly because of science fiction. There are a lot of people today, if you get into a religious conversation with them, they're thinking, well, if, if there were ancient aliens, that's just, that's just technology. That's just parsed as being a miracle. It's parsed as being an act of a God who is independent from creation. We're actually dealing with an extraterrestrial that has advanced technology. Again, this is... This is nothing new, I think, you know, for most in this immediate audience, at least in this room. And I think Shermer, his observation is on target. For a lot of people, they wouldn't even think about it. Wait, wait a minute. You know, some of the stuff that, you know, whether it's the Bible or something in the, in the Eastern tradition, some of the stuff they describe really is beyond you know, technology and creation. It's the easiest example. You know, how would how would we attribute that to a, a manufactured technology by a finite life form, whether it's extraterrestrial or not? A, a lot of people will not sort of probe the equation; they'll just accept it. That again, we, do we really need God and miracles if, if we have extraterrestrial life you know, you know, with advanced technology? It's just easy to go there, and even though we we don't have that. Today, as far as anybody really knows, the idea has been sort of beaten into our heads over and over and over again, so that it, it's it's just an easy thing to think about. It's an easy mental transition from one thing, traditional theism, to ET theism. These beings, this is Sagan again, are super civilization gods. These extraterrestrials that he's speculating about. Motivated by benevolence. That also is a speculation, by the way. And hundreds or thousands or millions of years beyond us, they possess sciences and technologies so far beyond their present capabilities as to be indistinguishable from magic. Again, he's also borrowing the phrase from Clark there. Well, if we have ET theism, or at least the idea sort of firmly planted in the Western mind by today, again, when I, when I say firmly planted, I mean for a lot of people, the idea that there is no God, there's just an advanced extraterrestrial. That's on the table for a lot of people, even though we don't have any solid evidence that there are extraterrestrials. And as I lectured yesterday, there's a, yes, a minority, but a significant uh, representation in the scientific community that the odds of having an extraterrestrial life form that's intelligent really are not that good. Despite that, despite having no evidence, despite something like the Drake equation being entirely contrived, people just are still there. That is on the table for them without any evidence at all. And science fiction and mass media, again, you know, 
visual forms of science fiction have maybe not put that into the heads of, of Westerners because that was done through through the written word in the 19th and 20th century. But it certainly reinforces it. And a visual reinforcement becomes pretty powerful. But if we have the ET uh, deity, ET theism, what is salvation? Well, extraterrestrial salvation is not about saving humans from sin. It's about saving humans from themselves. Okay. It's a little shift there. Humankind will remain vulnerable so long as it stays confined here on Earth. Martin Rees, Our Final Hours, A Scientist Warning, How Terror and Environmental Disaster Threaten Humankind's Future in This Century on Earth and Beyond. Rees' book basically advocates colonizing the United States because we're, we're all, we're all going to hopelessly destroy ourselves. Now, again, don't, don't be cynical about the you know, global warming thing and, and how controversial that is. Rees is a mainstream scholar and scientist, and he's, he's part of the significant number of people who believe our days are numbered for whatever reason. And so he, again, wants to prove it. Colonization. Well, wouldn't it be great if we could meet an extraterrestrial or could use extraterrestrial technology where the extraterrestrials would teach us how to pull this off, you know, how to get to space, how to how to advance in our technology either to save ourselves here or get out there. So that's the trajectory we're on. I really like this line again, not because I agree with it, but because I think it's well said. Heaven purged of religion is transformed into space. That's what it is. Because we already have this conception in terms of religion that, you know, where does God live? He lives out there. He lives up in the heavens, you know, of course, beyond earth, that sort of thing. Well, that's where the aliens live too. So again, that, that helps solidify this, this analogy, this equation. And really, when you think about it, if you, again, either are an atheist or, again, you want to substitute, swap in an extraterrestrial, that's really well said. It's really what you have. Heaven purged of religion is transformed into space. You're really talking about the same thing, except you don't have a deity. You have an extraterrestrial. These beings are here to save us from a newly redefined fallenness. Now, in traditional, again, Judeo Christian thinking, humanity has fallen. Again, that means a number of things. You don't want to relapse into a, into a theology lecture here. But fallenness is imperfection. It is, it is not possessing in and of ourselves immortality. Uh, it is being estranged from the God who created us, again, because of sin and so on and so forth. So it's a number of, of things. But in ET religion, again, and I hope you're catching the drift here, ET religion is this idea, again, that we, sh we shouldn't really be talking about God, or it makes less sense to talk about God than it does to talk about uh, fabulously transcendent extraterrestrial. If in that theology, well, it doesn't make any sense to have this thing you know, called a sin or estrangement. What estranges us from ET is that we're not them. We're not as advanced. We're not as you know, technologically astute. We're not as evolved spiritually or whatever. And all of this vocabulary is kind of familiar. So we have to redefine what the you know, fall of this means. Humanity is not lost in sin, but humanity is in the primitive stages of biological, spiritual, and social evolution. Humanity in its present condition is a threat to itself. It must be saved by a greater intelligence. So salvation in this worldview, this, this religious worldview, religious framework, is a greater intelligence coming along and showing us the error of our ways, not in terms of mending a relationship, between God and his creatures, his human creatures. But in terms of addressing our stupidity, okay, in terms of helping us to become more like our superiors and to save ourselves from ourselves. That would be the definition of saving humanity. Humanity is the divine image. Its destiny is to become divine. In a panspermia worldview, the divine image means we are like our extraterrestrial brethren or creators. So we need to talk a little bit about the term image of God. Now, it's very clear in 
Christian theology, biblical theology. And humankind is created in God's image. You know, this is a big you know, theological focus. Well, part of that, biblically speaking, is the beginning of it is associated with Eden. God creates a human family. He already has a divine family. He wants a human family as well. He creates a world where he can be among his embodied human creatures. On that world, he you know, you know, creates the garden. This is where he creates humanity. This is the beginning of God sort of blending his family, his human family with his divine family and him living in the midst of all of his creatures, his intelligent children. This is, again, the framework for the biblical story. And that's what God originally wanted and intended. God gives the humans a mandate and says, okay, now I'm going to have lots of babies because i got a big job for you. It's bigger than two people. I want you to go out and subdue the earth. I want you to be a steward of this place, a steward kingship. I'm giving it to you. And I want you to multiply because your job is to spread Eden, essentially, all over the rest of the world. And so you need to multiply to do that. And God wants earth to be like a second home for himself and his, the other members of his divine family. He wants a blended family. So the, the biblical idea is God come to earth with human beings, and that should be the normal circumstance. We, as embodied beings, should think of it as normal, as God intended to live in God's realm, to be a member of the divine family, even though we are human and divine and embodied. That's, that, that is the whole point of the early chapters of Genesis, where we know, again, that, that doesn't work well, there's a fall, there's estrangement, there's an expulsion from Eden and all that. But the idea that humans are supposed to be members of a divine family is a biblical That is a biblical idea. New Testament writers talk about it all the time. In Christian theology, it's referred to as the end point of sanctification. It's referred to as glorification. It's referred to as theosis in the Eastern tradition, Eastern Orthodox. It's referred to as deification. The scholars don't like use that term because they don't want to use a word in the language. Okay, so they're not, uh, the idea is a biblical one. Well, in a panspermia worldview where human life is a direct result of the seeding of the planet, seeding of Earth by intelligent extraterrestrials, in other words, we, they are our creators. In that view, the divine image means evolving to be like them. And this is a, a major theological tenet, a major theological trajectory in a lot of science fiction. Uh, again, just this notion of we are here to help you become us, that we are your benevolent you know, fathers, we're your benevolent creators. We're here to help you leap to the next stage of your evolution. And even in recent years, you, know, you, get, you get this thread of contact. It's not really recent, but the arrival, you know, there's, there's a little bit of this in it. Again, some of the more thoughtful extraterrestrial movies, but we're going to talk about movies here in a moment. But I mean, good grief, you know, 2001. I mean, look at the imagery. I mean, I'll show you some pictures, some still shots from it. But that is Theology 101, according to that movie, 2001. ET, again, it's speculated. Uh, ET evolution undoubtedly is propelled by science and technology, and so our evolution needs to be propelled by science and technology. Science and technology, uh, again, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the human population here now have already made science and technology their gods, but this pursuit of, of extraterrestrial contact, or at least, you know, wow, can we recover their technology and duplicate it? You know, it, it's for a lot of people, it's more than just, oh, that'll give us bigger guns than the Soviet Union or something like that. You know? For a lot of people, it's, it's more transcendent. The, the goal is different. The goal is not conquest. The goal is becoming, again, superior. It's leaping forward in evolution. This is where a guy like Ray Kurzweil, uh, again, his material, but the whole transhumanist idea has become uh, an important sort of ingredient in this theological mix, that it's our destiny to become more than human. And it, it just it just kicks that idea a little bit down the road of our minds. 
that gets us ready for it, that gets us prepared for it, or to endorse it, or to want it. And for it's marketed really well, actually. So our own evolution has to follow the same path that we too would show us the way. Space is where humanity will meet its gods. Eventually, if we get out there and we get far enough, we make enough noise or whatever, we start colonizing it. You know, send probes here and there, or of course, SETI, you know, signal other you know, possible intelligent uh, you know, races out there. Why do we do that? Well, it may not be verbalized, in some cases it is. And, and I've actually heard statements like this in academic meetings, uh, like the AAR. But one of the one of the reasons we want to do this is not just to know that there's other life forms. We want to meet our gods. We want to meet gods. Again, defined as beings that are so far superior to us that what else would we call them? I mean, what else would there be? We want to, again, achieve Eden. We want to do this. We want to evolve sufficiently, and we hope that, th that we can meet them and they can help us so that we can restore Eden ourselves. We want to attain unlimited knowledge. We want to you know, overcome human evil and stupidity. We want to transcend humanity itself. We want to be like they are. We want to be as gods. And it's really easy to put a theological spin on it. I think I have something about Peter Thiel in here. I hope I included that. If not, if I remember, I'd like to say a little bit more about him. Again, transhumanism is, is sort of the, the intersection of the technological mastery, the extraterrestrial, the, the, the new ET god, and our destiny. You know, while we're trying to meet our gods, we're going to do our best to become like them. We're going to do our best to transcend ourselves. We're going to do our best to become more than human. Because that's what they would want to do. We want to be like them. We want to do what they do, be like them, because that way, you know, we really will be fulfilling our destiny as their images, their imagers. You know, we're not we're not the image of a transcendent, you know, invisible, separate from creation beginning begin anymore. To be in the image of God, we, we advance ourselves so that we would be like them. Not like this invisible God of the Bible or something else, but to be like them. So we have this talk today about biological enhancement, genetic enhancement, uploading consciousness, synthetic biology. Nanotechnology, of course, the singularity to become spiritual machines where we can just transfer our consciousness from you know, machine form to machine form. There is Thiel. Okay. Peter Thiel, I, I like to include in this because Thiel is, his parents were, were Christians, uh, missionaries, I believe, in, in the evangelical tradition. Uh, Peter Thiel is, is the founder of PayPal, has lots of money. He's an enthusiastic transhumanist. Enthusiastic really is, is too weak of a word. He is, you know, he's beating the drum, but other word he can. And if you talk to him, he will he will cast this in explicitly theological terms. Some of the things that I just said. There's on the internet, I don't I don't have this included um, in this presentation, but you can find a, a video of a conversation between Peter Thiel and N.T. Wright. Now, if you don't know who N.T. Wright is. He's probably the most famous theologian in the Christian tradition today. Um, and you know, he's, he's, he's the real deal. He's a, he's a, he's a scholar. He's a, a genuine you know, Christian, not just Christian by name only. And you can find like, in this interview, it was arranged by, uh, I don't know if it was the Veritas Forum or something else, but it's a conversation between him and Thiel about transhumanism. And, and Wright is not antagonistic. I mean, he's, he's not going to be you know, agreeing with why Thiel is saying what he's saying. But he understands, because he is a theologian, that it is part of the human destiny to transcend humanity, to become glorified, to become like God. First John 3, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And that's what we are. And then John says, you know, someday... We will be like Jesus. Okay? Someday we will become like him. It doesn't mean we'll become gods and have our own planets and we'll become Yahweh's and God the Father's every other like Mormonism. What it means is that we will get new bodies like Jesus had. 
okay, we won't be limited by our humanity. We will become as close to, to being like Jesus as we can in his relationship to the Father. So Theo knows all this. This is his tradition. And so he, he would say things like, well, look, why are you opposing transhumanism? Isn't this what we're supposed to do? Aren't we supposed to become divine? Isn't this what the Genesis creation mandate really had at its core? Aren't we supposed to make Eden happen? With transhumanism and nanotechnology and synthetic biology, we can do things like eliminate disease. We can do things like eliminate genetic defects. Okay? We can do things like reverse or at least halt or maybe reverse the aging process. Because really, why most people die because their cells start to die. Okay, there's something in the cell that reaches a point where it starts to deteriorate and die. So, hey, if we can find out why each individual cell does that and stop it, now you can still get run over by your truck. Okay, but you will not age and die. Shouldn't we do that? Isn't that what God would want us to do? And it, this is how he'll frame the debate. And again, he, he's very you know, much you know, in favor of all this other exploration we're talking about. But the whole, what I'm talking about is the modern theological tenet of transcending humanity. And one of the specific forms of that is, boy, we hope E.T. helps us, but until we meet our gods, we'll, we'll try our best to do that, because that, that's just what we should be doing. A lot of people, again, will put it in theological garb, but a lot of people will. A lot of Christians will. And not, not really asking questions like, well, okay, that's that's the end of God wants, but is that really the means that God said this would happen? Is this really the means that God said he'll bring this about? No. And Peter Thiel never seems to ask that question. He assumes the end is addressed in the Bible, but not the means. They're both addressed. They're both there. He skips one and goes to the other. The extraterrestrial gospel, though, we already have a hint of this. Science fiction, again, propaganda blurs the lines between ET and Christian theism and Christology. It's about messaging, again, not sort of cartoonish nonsense. And lots of space and film and pages have been devoted to this. We have a new heavenly father and a new heavenly son. And the heavenly father is going to be you know, cast as some non human, you know, god like uh, figure from some other place. And he's going to have a son, of course. And this, this gets carried out a lot uh, in film. I just want to get into some films now and start talking about some of these motifs. In Close Encounters of the Third Kind, did you ever notice that the Christian minister, there's a, you know, in the, in the final scene where the big you know, mothership descends on the top of the mountain there, and then they start saying, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to do an exchange. You know, some of you ETs are going to stay here and you know, all this stuff. We're going to send some people with you. You know, the Richard Dreyfus character, of course, gets you know enthusiastically drafted into this. And there's a minister, as they're going on to the mothership, he reads from Psalm 9111 before humans, you know, they're, they're actually take off in the ship. And the verse says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Well, who are the angels? You, know, you could say, well, the priest is praying that the angels of God will protect the humans from, you know, on their trip to wherever. Okay. But you could also say that the verse is there to reinforce or plant the idea that the ETs are the angels. They're the ones that will take care of the humans. That they promise to take good care of them on their way. Anybody else know where this passage is quoted in the Bible? Satan <laughs> Well, it's, it, he's, in, he's in the scene. Yeah, Satan is in the scene. But who quotes it? Jesus quotes it you know, to ward off you know, Satan's temptation. And of course, the implication is that he is the one being protected you know, in the context, which is a real interesting spin if the angels are extraterrestrials. Again, so if you have in your mind how that passage is actually used in the New Testament, you have again this mental connection for it. So, again, that's a bit of an obtuse example. E.T. possesses powers to heal, 
soar through the heavens. Again, if you've seen the movie, he has a spiritual connection with the boy Elliot. And of course, E.T. rises from the dead <clears throat> in the movie. Again, it's, this is, this is, these are Christ motifs applied to E.T. You know, this, this is stuff that, that divine beings would do, or angels or gods or something like that. Day of the Earth stood still, again, two versions of it. Um, <laughs> anybody remember the name of the alien who is actually Klaatu in, in the alien language? Anybody remember the name? Of the guy who, who passes himself off as John Carpenter, abbreviations J C. You know, the film drops a lot of this kind of subtle stuff, and we call them Easter eggs. Even now, but they've been doing this for a long time. And it, it, if you're familiar with the story, he's a savior figure you know, that humans turn on and kill. You know, again, there, there are elements of the gospel story, the story of Jesus, that are put into the, the day the earth stood still. But, you know, Jesus is swapped out for an alien. And they do. Superman. This is Superman in the academic literature is a famous Christ figure. Everybody likes to write about Superman because it's so obvious. Um, and Superman, of course, is an extraterrestrial. He's the earth. Now you say, well, it's kind of pressing things a little bit. Here's a scene from the first Superman. This is when he's going to go and save the Earth. When he finally gets off of the mothership where he's been imprisoned, when he does the, the crucifixion pose. Of course, he goes and later in Batman and Superman, he dies. Does anybody not think that Superman's going to rise from the dead? <laughs> well, don't you know the comics? I mean, come on, you know? <clears throat> Father and son. Odin and Thor. Yeah. Thor, the first movie. What happens to Thor? He dies, it seems. I think we'll, we'll give him credit for death. It's a good death scene. Saving humanity. And then he pops out of it when his father, you know, approves, when his father approves of his selfless act. And the hammer comes back and throw it on. Okay. Yeah, you know, this is if, if you if you want to go back to the you know, late antiquity, when Christians are trying to evangelize you know, the Nordic territories, Christian missionaries are going to use connections between Odin and Thor to do evangelism. It's, it's called syncretism. I'm not recommending it because it gets you into all sorts of theological trouble later on. But they would do it because there's some similarities here. This is a terrific book. Don't let the covers deceive you. If you're interested in this subject, I highly recommend Our Gods Wear Spandex. It's Christopher Knowles, A Secret History of Comic Book Heroes. And basically, this book is all about how Marvel and DC Comics propel not only different forms of what we would call today the alien narrative, Again, you know, aliens you know, really are, are, are the gods of, of human beings at, at all different stages of history. How comic book characters and comic book arcs, you know, mythic arcs in, in the comic book series, how they put forth that idea, that theology. But Knowles also does get into theology, how comic books do theology, but of course they swap in different characters. They use biblical stories and theological ideas as the beginning point for a lot of their own you know, episodes, their own stories. It's really a good book. What's his name? Christopher Knowles. This one is a more academic tome, uh, even though it's a, little, it's a paperback. It's, it's not dense reading. It's pretty easy reading. Um, Gullias teaches, at a, uh, teaches history at a community college. I can't remember where. But extraterrestrials in the American zeitgeist alien contact tale since the 1950s. Again, what he does is he, he'll go through the, again, the, the contact team sort of era, and he will talk about how he'll, he'll give you touch points with science fiction and how science fiction contributed to forming the, the alien mythos in, in the 20th century. And if you've ever been, if, you have, if you've been in this subject for any amount of time, you know, you've all heard of 
you know, how this sort of happened, how early you know, serials, you know, magazines, comic books, you know, to Ray Palmer, who was a big figure, Jack Kirby for Marvel, uh, how what they wrote actually helped form and fill out what we think of today as the alien narrative. And in some cases, it gets very specific. Uh, I would recommend, again, if you read books by, by and about Kirby okay, or Ray Palmer, um, you'll begin to see some striking similarities between stuff they published that sound, uh, I'll just use Roswell for example, that sounds suspiciously like the Roswell story before that ever became popular. And people have noticed this. Uh, scholars and other academics have, have tracked on, on who isn't curious you know, how one thing sort of contributes to the other. Is the science fiction writer sort of compelling the narrative, the UFO narrative, or do they get their ideas from the UFO narrative and then write their stories? Well, it's actually a little bit of both. But it's really interesting, again, to actually go through something you know, laid out in the academic that makes that case. Knowing, again, if you've ever seen this movie, if, if you're into this sort of subject matter, I would certainly recommend it. I know we, some people just don't like Nicolas Cage. Don't let that discourage you. This is really a good movie. Uh, these guys here are, you don't know if they're villains or if they're good guys you know, as you're getting into the, you know, the movie, but the thesis of the movie is that, we'll see what I have on the next slide. I'll show that much. The thesis of the movie is that Nicolas Cage's little boy finds a, at school they buried a time capsule back when you know, Cage was, was young. And now it's, it hits the 20, 25 year mark or whatever it was. And so he takes the kid to school. They're going to pull out the time capsule and see what the little kids, you know, way back when, you know, put in the time capsule. And one of the, one of the kids, you, you see this in a flashback in the film. It's a little girl who's obviously disturbed and you suspect possibly abused. And on the day that they're supposed to draw pictures and stuff to put in the time capsule, this little girl is sitting in the back of the room and drawing nothing but numbers, row after row after row after row of numbers. And the teacher just kind of freaks out, and tries to stop her from doing it, and finally takes the paper away. They put it in the time capsule. Well, Cage's kid is, you know, they pull the time capsule out, and every kid gets an envelope. Of course, Cage's kid gets the one with the numbers. And Cage is an atheistic astrophysicist, but he stumbles on the discovery that these numbers correspond to dates of tragic events, catastrophic events, and the body counts for each one. So he spends like a whole night in Google tracking all of the data and gets freaked out. And ultimately the story is religious because the last date doesn't really have a number, it has EE on it, which means they find out everybody else is gonna die. So it's actually a prophecy of you know, the apocalypse. And the imagery of Ezekiel, and in this case, it includes the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation repurposes the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel's vision, and Revelation 4 and 5, for those who aren't familiar with that, becomes a prominent element in the story. So that by the end, I, mean, this, I would have had to have shown you part of the, of the movie. But there's this sort of fantastic vision at the end where you have a recreation of what the filmmaker thought Ezekiel's wheel chariot thing would have looked like. And of course, it's populated by extraterrestrials. And they come to take the little boy, and he makes a friend along the way, this girl, to a new Eden, and everybody else dies. So it's a direct link with biblical prophecy, biblical imagery associated with angels of God, the divine throne with extraterrestrials. It's, it's very explicit. And, you know, I, I don't want to be a killjoy here. I, I like watching this. This is a good movie. It has high entertainment value. And I sat there at the end and I thought, you know, if I was a filmmaker and I was thinking about, you know, creating imagery for Ezekiel 1, that's the way I do it. It's actually very striking, the way they do it. They really put some thought into it. But it's, it's just overt messaging, it's theological messaging. Again, they're here to save us from ourselves. 
save us from oblivion. Uh, you know, in this case, it's the, the culprit is not global warming. It has something to do with a solar flare. 2001, of course, the famous space odyssey. Again, at the end of the movie, you know, Dave evolves into a cosmic, a cosmic humor. I, I don't know, any, you know how else you really put it. But of course, the, the pictures of Dave being you know, reborn as a baby, but yet with these adult features, you know, drifting out you know, into space, you know, are, are quite famous. It's a very clear and overt casting of theological idea of human evolution transcending humanity of Earth itself and becoming a cosmic being. Arthur C. Clarke in 3001, see, well, now they were lords of the galaxy and could row the world among the stars. That's human destiny in Clarke's vision. It, it, it's just a classic point, you know, ET theology, ET salvation. I just want to go through some, some superheroes, and it's just real fast and, you know, unfortunately kind of superficial. Have you noticed that your superheroes are one of two things? They are either aliens, extraterrestrials, or humans, or they are enhanced humans. Okay. They use some kind of technology. Now, the vision in, in Marvel is, is essentially human consciousness married to a technological wonder. So he's kind of a part of the part of the hybrid. Captain America, enhanced human. You know, Iron Man is an enhanced human. The Hulk is an enhanced human. Not that he likes it, but there you go. The whole gamma ray thing. Spider Man is an enhanced human. X Men, well, they're mutants. That's what they are. There's something more than human. I, I, wanna, I think this is the end, but I want to end with Prometheus. Prometheus, of course, is the prequel to the Alien series. And this is, again, extraordinarily overt and would have been more overt in its, in its recasting Christian theology into a, a, an extraterrestrial religion had Ridley Scott's original script been the, uh, the focal point of, um, of the actual film. So if you remember the movie, these are, anybody remember the name? These are the engineers. And these are going to be the creators. And one of the engineers sacrifices himself to drink something, and his body deteriorates, and his DNA goes into the, the soupy you know, mix that is on the new earth, you know, this, this virgin planet that doesn't have life. Here's the scene. And his DNA eventually evolves into us, the human beings. They are our creators in the story. Eventually, again, humans. We get this alien messaging, you know, we kind of skip a lot of the plot, but they travel back to the place where the engineers come from and they encounter them. And of course, it's kind of interesting, the engineers turn out to be giants. Is that kind of an interesting twist? Um, they're, they're, they're divine beings, they're, not, they're also giants, so, so we're mixing the Genesis 6 stuff in there. Um, to understand the rest of what I'm going to show you here, the Prometheus uh, myth from Greek mythology, Prometheus is a titan, and he is a trickster titan, a trickster figure, credited with creating man from clay. He's also referred to as the divine gardener, uh, again, from the heavens, or in this case, from space. In the movie, the engineers look smooth like white clay, and then going back here, that's intentional. Our DNA comes from theirs. He defies, Prometheus defies the gods, by giving fire to humanity in the Greek myth. This gift enabled civilization and progress. Prometheus is known as the champion of humanity, and he's sentenced to eternal torment by Zeus. So he, he's, he's bound every, every day, and an eagle comes and rips out his liver and you know, you know, heals only to have it happen all again in the same day. That's his torture. And he comes to feed the liver, it grows back, and it gets eaten the next day. Now, let me skip ahead. Well, there's, there's the image right there. This is hard to see, and I'm not going to give you a website where you can actually get a better view of this. But here is 
the Prometheus figure, and this is one of the engineers. You can see the human form here. And he's got his, his side torn open here. And he, it's really hard to see, but the, the one that tears at him is one of the, the aliens, you know, from the alien movie. So think, you have to think a little bit abstractly here. You know, the giver of human life having his abdomen torn open, he's a dying God. Well, it's obvious Jesus, the spirit of the creator, redeemer, giving his life for humanity. And of course, keeping the devil at bay, which is the alien figure. But if you go to movies.com, and, you know, there's a few other sites. There's one I'll just spell it for you. Uh, it's, it's a blog called you know, by a guy that goes by the name Cavalon, C-A-V-A-L-O-R-N. He has a long sort of Gnostic, alien Gnostic theological expose on this movie. It's actually quite interesting. If, you, if you've seen the movie, the main character is a female. She's a redhead. Her name is Elizabeth. Think Bible here, Elizabeth. You know, and there's, there's a Mary name in, in the film as well, you know, to associate with her. She ends up being impregnated with, with the alien. She performs a cesarean birth on herself. I'm not going to tell you how she does that. But of course, the alien is birthed. Uh, again, there's all sorts of like mixed biblical images in this, but the real kicker is never made it into the film. If you go up to movies.com, they're interviewing a Ridley Scott, and, they, and they, they say, we heard it was scripted that the engineers were targeting our planet for destruction because we had crucified one of them, one of their representatives, and that Jesus Christ might have been an alien. Was that ever considered? And Ridley Scott's response, we definitely did. And then we thought that it was a little too on the nose. But if you look at it as an, our children are misbehaving down their scenario, there are moments where it looks like we've gone out of control, running around with armor and skirts, which of course would be the Roman Empire. They were given a long run, a thousand years before the disintegration actually started to happen. And then you can say, well, let's send down one of our emissaries to see if we can stop it. Guess what? They crucified him. So this is where Scott wanted to go in the movie, uh, in Prometheus. Um, we'll stop there. You know, if you want the slide presentation, this is the URL we'll get it, but just a few you know, sort of closing comments. Movies like Prometheus, Movies like 2001, they're, they're, they're the most well-known, knowing, the most overt sorts of examples, but it is really hard. It's really hard to find a science fiction movie or a superhero movie that does not do theology. We have Guardians of the Galaxy, which I love. It's the second one. Right? Everybody, everybody see Guardians 2? Okay, do you, remember, do you remember how it ends with that advanced race, you know, getting ticked off because they didn't get the Guardians? And so they're going to make sort of a, a super version of themselves. What, what do they call it? What does she say? What's the last line of the movie? I think we'll call him Adam. Adam. Now that's going to be Adam Warlock, if you're familiar with the comic book material, who is a Christ figure. Go, go Google it. Look it up on Wikipedia, Adam Warlock. And if you know the comic book stories in the arts, it's all theology. And again, the, the, the comic books, the movies, we didn't really get into TV shows here. They retell biblical stories and biblical theology through their characters. Now you can say, well, you know, maybe, maybe they do that because those are just good stories. It's good storytelling. And, and it is. It's compelling storytelling. But it's hard to believe that, again, over and over and over again, especially when you read something like this Ridley Scott interview, that there's not some intentionality behind it. And, I, and when I say that, I'm not saying that, oh, you're saying that, oh, I just hate Christians. I hate no, I'm not saying that at all. I guess you got some of those people. Okay, whatever. What I'm saying is that intentionally or unintentionally, it gets masses of people, millions and millions and millions of people, to think about God and Jesus and humanity and human destiny and salvation, the major core elements of theology, it gets them to think about all those things in a different way. And in such a way that erases God, Jesus, <laughs> erases all those things. 
It completely redefines it. And you know, that just it becomes part of the way people process the biblical message. And trust me, folks, it, it, well, sometimes it helps, but often it doesn't. <laughs> You know, when, when you try to you know, talk to people about spiritual things, we're already in a post-Christian culture. You know, I don't have any qualms about saying that. Uh, and, and you can you can be sit here and be fearful about that. I'm actually not. You know, I won't I won't lapse into this, but for a number of reasons, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a really good thing. But the fact of the matter is, you have to realize that when you try to have a spiritual conversation with people. They're not parsing terms like you parse them. And in some cases, they may not even be capable of that. You're going to have to sort of get into this world and, and how this world trains people to think about big theological concepts. You're going to have to be able to interact with that, with a lot of people, and just help them see, you yeah, know, there's similarities here, and that might build a bridge to the discussion, but there are significant disconnections here. That you're ultimately going to have to address. That's all I have for today. If you have any questions, uh, I don't know if, how Guy wants to wrap up here. But anybody. And if you're interested in this, I really recommend Our God's Worst Spandex. Um, there are other books uh, in this genre, subgenre, if you can call it that. But that's really a good one. It's very readable, good examples, lots of illustrations. It's, it's really quite good. And then Robbie Graham's Silver Screen Saucer, I think, just for the general Hollywood UFO science fiction. Anybody at all? All right, thank you for coming.